Hi there. Now, let's see if I can get this to wake up again. Da, 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 da. Get there eventually. What? That's not even one of my slides. <laughs> that slide doesn't appear anywhere in my deck. Oh, hi, I'm Alex, um, and I'm here to talk about testing. Um, testing is the part of DevOps and continuous delivery that, in my opinion, always gets missed out, especially in database land. Um, a bit about me, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm the, uh, uh, the founder and principal consultant at DLM Consultants. Um, I focus purely on that niche of taking the databases and helping people to release those more regularly and more reliably. Um, I'm also passionate about the community. Uh, I'm one of the co-organizers of London Continuous Delivery Meetup, um, and I am also one of the co-organizers of SQL Relay, uh, which I'll talk a bit, uh, just briefly about later. It's a free conference that tours around the UK, um, kind of like five SQL Saturdays in, in one week, um, if you're interested. That's enough of slides. We hide behind slides too much. I just want to talk to you guys. Um, How many people here have read any books about software development in the last 20 years? Yeah? They tend to talk about things like agile, DevOps, continuous delivery, getting to market quickly, okay? We care about the pace at which we can get this feature out. We care about delivering a small piece of work, um, a small piece of work in one release at a time regularly. It, there's less stuff that's likely to go wrong. It's easy to work out what does go wrong. We can get a small slither of our product to market more quickly. Um, we can get feedback about whether it works. It's become the conventional wisdom about how to, do data, uh, how to do DevOps and how to do continuous delivery. It's what most of us aspire toward. Do, would we all agree with that? We're generally mostly working in that direction. Great. Now, databases pose an interesting pr set of problems. Um, we've got persistent databases to deal with. We have to deal with the data that's there. Frankly, deploying web apps in an automated way, well, a bunch of people are going to hurt me for saying that, but relative to databases, it is. Okay. I can deploy my new web app to the server, point IIS at the new location. That's kind of it. Okay. Um, job's done. If I have a problem, I can just point IIS back to where it was before, and I've got an easy rollback. Databases are, more, databases are more problematic. We have to care about the data that's already in production. We have to care about not just where we want to get to, what we want the end state to look like, but we also have to care about how we get there. And I know Ed's going to be talking after me, and he's going to be talking in more detail about the source control and deployment part, which is, sorry, um, yeah, yes, Ed, Ed. It's also Ed. <laughs> Sorry, the two Eds sat next to each other, and one of them looked up at me and said, no, I'm not. <laughs> Panic there. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so Ed's going to talk afterwards about how we can solve some of those source control and deployment problems. Um, and that's a very, very important part. How many people here have got our databases and source control? 50-50? Mm, a couple of hands up there at the back. I'm sure you have. Um, how many people have try to automate the deployment of those databases, kind of an automated process to deploy through various different environments. Yeah, a sprinkling of hands. It's kind of becoming a more established process nowadays. It's kind of how we do database development. Because if we want to release in a small batches regularly, we need to be able to automate that process. Because if there's a massive overhead every single time we release, that's problematic. How many people have made a change to one part of a database? and something unexpected has broken. A few hands going up. Is, is anybody that that's never happened to? One person over there, do you not work with databases? <laughs> You're just, ah, you never make mistakes. If you never make mistakes, you're excused from this talk. I personally make screw up all of the time. 
Um, so that poses us with an interesting problem. If I can make a change here, and I can break the database in some unpredictable way, how do I protect myself against that? Okay. And the answer, I'm afraid to say it, is before you release, as a minimum, you need to go through every single use case of your system with all the different sets of parameters that you could have going into it and check they all work. That sound pr practical? That's the only way you can be confident that everything that it's designed to do still works. If it's going to break in unpredictable ways, then you need to test out, see if you've missed anything. Now, if we're now at a point where we're releasing frequently on a daily, on an hourly basis, that's a huge amount of overhead, okay? So you have to automate it. There's no way around it. You have to automate it. It has to be something that you can do to click a button, run through a bunch of tests to check the most important functions of your thing still work. So before I asked how many people had their database and source control and half the people put their hands up, I asked how many people are deploying automatically and maybe a third of the people put their hands up. How many people are doing any sort of automated testing for their database? Three people, four, one of which actually contributed to the tools I'm going to be showing you. <laughs> Last night, I was at the speaker dinner, and I sat uh, next to Jeffrey Snova and Stephen Thayer, and it was, it was fascinating watching those two people talk. They're both incredibly smart. Um, and Steve was asked a question, um, do you think continuous delivery in DevOps is just the way that we do business now? Is it becoming the norm? To which I kind of laugh because it's absolutely not. The, t the clients that I go to, they are a long way from doing that. And his response was interesting. The assumption was going to be that kind of we're all getting better, we're all getting faster at delivering. But actually, Steve's response was actually, I think the gap is getting further apart. There are the people that get DevOps and they're racing ahead. There are the people that don't get DevOps and they're lagging further and further behind and they're going to die. But then actually there's this big group of people in the middle who have done the source control and deployment part, but they've missed out the testing part. And as a result, they're shipping bugs to production faster than they ever did before. There's, a, there's, a, there's this idea that to screw up and break production is human, but to automate that deployment, that screw up to a thousand servers is DevOps. And there's a lot of truth in that. And it's the people who have put as much time into thinking about reliability and testing that are the people that are successful. And the rest of us are suffering with all of the problems that a lack of testing is producing. How many people here would hire a .NET developer that didn't believe in writing tests? None of you, okay? Because it's such an established thing now. Like, like what I'm saying now is not special, it's nothing new, that's just the, the truth. Like in, like, in, on the application side of things, people have been playing with JUnit and XUnit and stuff for, for however long. And that's just become how you do software development now. Whether or not you agree with TDD as a principle, uh, how many people are familiar with TDD? Good, I don't have to have that discussion, okay? Um, I'm not gonna get into the debates about whether TDD is the right way or the wrong way to do it, but the point is, I guarantee any way that is a bad way to do software development, and that's not to do automated testing. That is a bad testing strategy. And it makes me angry that nobody is doing automated software testing. So what I'm gonna do in this session uh, is I'm going to introduce you to a test framework called T sql 2. That's pretty much all the slides I've got, by the way. Um, I'm, I'm not big on slides with words on, so I hope you um, aren't either, because I, I think at the end I've got a slide that has three words on it, and that's my summary slide. Um, uh, so I'm gonna show you T sql T, which is a unit test framework that you can use for SQL Server. I'm gonna just go through the basics of how it works, what's included there, and how you can find more information, so how you can get started. And I'm also gonna show you, um, I'm gonna demo one way, and I'm gonna explain three other ways about how you can uh, wrap that into VSTS, depending on how you've decided to um, set up your source control and deployment process, because it'll be a little bit different depending on whether you're using uh, SSTT or Ready Roll or Flyaway or whatever you're using to wrap up your source control and deployment process. I am now gonna sit down, so I need to move this, so I apologize if that makes a lot of noise, or you end up losing my audio. Right. 
tsqlt.org is where you're going to start. Um, that is the home page for tsqlt. Um, you've got lots of information here, including um, uh, da -da -da -da, a user guide over here, um, which has kind of full documentation of everything. Um, I should add that there are, um, this is not the only unit test framework for SQL Server. There are many unit test frameworks. There are, there are different things that you can, there's a bunch of unit testing that's built into um, uh, SSDT and Visual Studio nowadays. Um, uh, I quite like T-SQL-T. It's open source, it's written in SQL. Um, you can contribute, I like those things about it. Um, uh, I, I also believe in the idea that you should write your unit tests in the same language as the language that you're testing. Um, and my justification for that is, who are you writing your unit tests for? Well, partly yourself, but also partly whoever's going to come along and maintain your code after you. And you don't know what software languages they're going to be able to work with. You don't know, what they're, you don't know whether they're going to be proficient at C Sharp. But you do know that they're going to be good at SQL, because they're a SQL developer or they're maintaining SQL code. So for me, I would argue that it's valuable to write the code the tests in the same language as the code. So for me, T SQL T is a good example. It's also probably the most widely used, um, certainly the most widely used open source um, SQL Server unit testing framework, I think, probably. Um, I don't have any statistics on that, so I might be wrong, but that's my judgment based on what I've seen. From this website, you've got a couple of links at the side. The top one is the one you're most interested in. Uh, this is uh, um, this is actually the download for T-SQL-T, and this is what you get. Uh, you download it, and uh, you just get five scripts, of which there are a couple that are important. So first of all, you get this very straightforward script. Um, T-SQL-T requires that CLR is enabled on your database. Now, there are known security flaws with that. You do not put this on production. Um, T-SQL-T relies on um, on some CLRs, it, it, you need to set this to be able to run T SQL T. You stick it on your dev box, you don't put it on production. Okay? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to run this against our dev box. I've already done that. The next thing that you're going to do is you're going to run this script, <coughs> which is quite a lot larger. And this is the script that actually installs T SQL T. Okay? I've got one I made earlier here. So I've got this database here. And you can see it's added a whole bunch of T-SQL-T objects. Um, so these are the stored procedures, for example. Um, can everybody read from that far back, or do you want me to be zooming? Zooming, yes or no, and I'm mainly looking at the people in the back row. Zoom it. OK, zoom it. I thought I'd start it already. So a whole bunch of objects get added to your database. Store procedures, uh, a bunch of tables, some functions. This is how T-SQL-T works. It's a bunch of stuff that you add to your database. Again, you don't want this in production. With some old, um, in the past, you also had to set Trustworthy to be on, but I think recent versions of T-SQL-T don't, don't require that anymore, do they? No. Um, so you don't want this stuff in production, but you do want it in dev. Okay? And here you've got a bunch of um, commands that allow you to do all the sorts of stuff that you would expect of a modern unit testing framework. It allows you to do mocking, it allows you to make assertions, it allows you to fake data, that sort of stuff. And it's also going to take into account um, things like uh, cleaning up. So um, when I'm going to run some tests, typically what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some scenario called assemble. I'm going to carry out some action the code under test, and then I'm going to assert that the correct result has happened. And as a result of doing that, I'm probably going to play with the data in the database. And this is, another, again, a reason I don't want to do this in production, because I don't want to be messing with my production data. How T-SQL-T handles this is it wraps all of the tests into one transaction, and once it's run that transaction, it rolls it back. But it persists the results of the tests so that you can see whether or not the tests worked. 
Uh, how many people here are familiar with unit testing in general? How many people have done it before? Everybody, okay. So I don't need to lecture you on how to unit test. So, um, I've installed T SQL T. I've not written any tests or anything at this point, so let's get started. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna execute the command T SQL T new, um, new test class, okay? And I'm gonna give this a name. So my new test class, uh, I'm just gonna first check that T SQL T is working. So I'm gonna call it something along the lines of verify uh, T SQL T, for example. So let's execute that. Oh. And what I can do now is I can create my first test. So what I'm gonna do again, I'm gonna um, execute, uh, no, 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 I'm not. I'm gonna just create the test. And it's gonna be called, it's gonna be in the verify T SQL T schema. I think that's what I called it before and I'm gonna give it a name. Now, tests in T SQL T all have to be prefixed with the word test space. That's something that caught me out before, because I created a bunch of tests. I didn't start them test space, um, and I couldn't work out why T SQL T couldn't pick up on my tests. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write test whether T SQL T is working, for example. Then I need to create some logic in some tests. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go T SQL T dot assert equals, uh, hang on, no I'm not, I'm gonna go exec T SQL T assert equals, uh, da -da -da. and I'm going to do this again so I get the IntelliSense, and I'm gonna assert that true equals true, who knew? So let's execute this. And now I've got a test, and that test is going to exist as a, um, if I refresh my stored procedures here, it's going to exist as a stored procedure on my desk. So I've got uh, now verify t sql t um, dot test whether uh, t sql t is working. Now when I run that, I'm not just gonna run it from, uh, I'm not just gonna execute the command, because that will negate all the clever stuff with transactions that happens to make sure that you don't mess around with your data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the uh, um, t sql t dot run all command. And if I execute that, I should get some nice feedback in the output. Let me zoom in here. Result error. Hmm. That was unexpected. What have I done wrong? What have I done wrong? Never type during demos. I thought I'd practice this enough that I wasn't going to make a mistake. Sorry? Ah, yes, that's right. I forgot to remove the gump that my, uh, that my, uh, um, there we are. Thank you. Uh, that was the gump that my uh, IntelliSense was creating for me. Um, so yeah, now we've got some interesting results here. We've got a list of all the tests that have been run, and we can see whether they're successful or not. And we can begin to start building a suite of tests to verify whether the, log whether the logic in my database works. Okay, so that was obviously a bit of a silly example. It was just check whether true equals true. Well, yes, true does equal true. So now let's look at a more real world example. So I'm gonna create a new test suite. Exec t sql t dot new test class even. And I'm gonna call this unit tests. And I have, here's one I did make earlier, because this is quite a bit of text. So I have a, um, so this is an example of a more realistic 
unit test that follows the assemble act um, assert model. Uh, if I zoom in, is that going to be too big? No, perfect. Ah. So the first thing I'm going to draw out here is this interesting command up here. T sql t fake table. What this does is it renames a particular table on my database, in this case the st contacts table. So it's saving all the data over here, and then it creates a brand new table with the with kind of the pre-existing name and constraints and the rest of it. Um, so that I now have a clean area for testing. I can now squirt into that whatever data I want to set it up appropriately to start my tests. One of the principles of unit testing is I should always start with a consistent set of data because if I'm if I'm just running these tests with whatever data happens to be in my database at the time, then I can get flickering results. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And if my test sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, what does it tell you? It tells you nothing, okay? So I want a test that's going to run um, always based on the same set of data every single time. So I'm gonna use this fake table to create an empty space, and as it happens, I want to start with this table being empty. The next thing I'm going to do uh, is this section here. So I'm gonna execute the add contact stored procedure. Okay, and I'm gonna do that with a couple of parameters, uh, Alex Yates and Alex Yates at dlmconsultants.com. And uh, that, I won't bother showing it to you, it's probably fairly self-explanatory what that stored procedure is gonna do, it's gonna take those parameters and squirt them into the database. And then finally, um, the assertion comes at the bottom, I'm gonna look at um, what actually went into that table and then I'm gonna check that it matches what I expected that it would. And by doing this, I can verify whether that stored procedure does what I would expect it to. Um, so I recently uh, was working uh, at a bank uh, in the United States, um, and they had a bunch of logic in their database um, that um, did things like setting exchange rates on various different accounts based on the amount of money in the account, if it was over a million dollars, if it was under a million dollars. That's interesting, because it's plugged in. No, it's not plugged in. My apologies. I had to unplug it when I tried to play you a silly bit video at the beginning. There we are. That's better. Um, so what I would recommend is writing tests like this that basically play with all your boundary conditions, all of your unexpected data. What would you expect to happen? Let's say if it was you expected a different interest rate, for example, at a, um, at a million dollars, then what, what happens if the interest rate is exactly a million? What happens if the amount in the account is exactly a million dollars? What if it's one cent above? What if it's one cent below? What happens if it's zero? What happens if you have a negative number? What happens if you have a really big number? What happens if you have empty string? All of these weird cases, and make sure that the expected behavior occurs as a result. Um, testing constraints, by the way, is a funny one. Um, so in order to test a constraint, you have to set up a scenario, break, break the constraint, capture the output, um, and then verify that that matches what you expected. That's kind of the way that we do that. So let's take a look at this working. Uh, did I actually create that procedure? Let me just double check. I can't remember if I did now. No, I don't think I did. Let's try it. Ah, there it is. Yep. Uh, and now I'm going to run uh, my command. And now we have two passing builds. If I wanted to demonstrate what would happen if this failed, I'm just going to uh, script that as an alter. And this email address column here, let's say someone was a little bit drunk when they wrote it, um, part gave a data type of an email type uh, of a varchar three, for example. Um, and now let's go and execute run all. And we get a handy little message here 
Um, expected DLM consultants, but well, I told you he was drunk. Um, so let's fix that before we commit that to source control. Cool. So we can now, uh, and before I stop, I'm going to run my unit test again, just to double check that's fixed it. Yes, it has fixed it. Now we can carry on. So now we have a tool that developers can use um, to add tests to their development database. We can check that into source control with the rest of our code. Uh, all developers can now run the suite of tests against their development database before they're checking in their code or before you do a release. And in doing it this way, it avoids the manual overhead of having to manually test all the different use cases of your system every single time you do a release or every single time you commit. Like if we're going to follow the uh, principles of continuous integration, the idea is that every single time I make a commit, there's going to be auto an automatically verifying build that's going to run tests. Wouldn't it be really, really great if when I make that mistake and break something unexpected, I find out about it immediately after I've written the code, and then I get a message that says, hey, by the way, as a result of what you've just changed, this logic over here that was supposed to do this no longer does this. That would be fantastic from a development point of view, because now I can actually make sure I'm building quality into my code, and I can make sure I'm not making the system worse, and it can help me to maintain quality. It is an overhead. Uh, while I talk, I'm actually just going to commit it to source control and trigger a build. Um, so. There are many source control products available. This is the one that I use, because I used to work for the company that made this one. Um, uh, you can see here's the, uh, the test that I've been writing, the, the schemas and so on. Uh, so I'm going to write a comment adding some, some tests. And I'm going to commit that to source control. I'm also just going to push that up to, um, I know I, slightly cheated. I told you I was going to be using VSTS. I'm actually using on-premise Git on a VM that I can revert, so I can do the same demo multiple times and hopefully get my reliability that way, so I cheated slightly. But TF TFS and VSTS are basically the same thing, right? Um, so if I now go to the Build tab, you can see I've got a build in progress. And if I go to the logs, we'll see how long this takes. This was normally taking about a minute. Uh, previously, but um, so that's built the database. So it's checked that the code actually compiles and builds a proper database. And then what it's going to do is it's going to go through. It's going to build a database from scratch from the package that I've created um, uh, that's deployable with Octopus Deploy or the STS Release Management, whatever you want to use. Um, and it's going to run the tests again at the end of that. So now this is going to happen as part of my build process. It, there we are. It's finished successfully, 49 seconds. Um, I can also, as part of this CI process, I can go and look at the tests column, uh, the, the tests uh, the, the tab. Uh, I can see all sorts of information here. Um, I can change this to look at all the passing tests, and I can see kind of which tests have been passed, and I can see kind of code coverage and stuff. Um, uh, actually. So code coverage is something you can add in by a tool called SQL Cover that Ed wrote. It's fantastic. I haven't included it in this demo because I didn't want to cover too much. Um, but uh, do look at SQL Cover. It can give you stats about how much of how much of your test is how much of your code base is actually covered by tests. Now the way I put this together is because I happen to be using. So, so I'm coming to this with an assumption that everybody here is probably using one of the following four techniques for source control. One is SSDT, one is ReadyRoll, one is Redgate SQL Source Control, and the other is some sort of open source migration framework, like Flyway or DBUP or something like that. I'm going to guess that one of those four options more or less covers most of the people in this room. So I'm going to explain how we would actually do this based on each one of those four processes. Okay. So uh, this is the one I happen to have on my machine already. Uh, it's using the uh, Redgate tools. So if I go to the Build tab uh, in TFS, um, and take a look at this. I am also making an assumption that you guys, is everybody here familiar with the VSTS uh, and TFS tool? Is anybody who needs a little bit of guidance about what this tool actually is and what it does? Okay, I'll move forward on the assumption that everybody knows our way around TFS. Okay. Um, so if we go to look at how I've set up this build, um, there's literally just two steps. Uh, 
Uh, there's a plugin that Redgate provide um, called uh, the DLM Automation plugin, I believe, build. Um, uh, and we've added the step, uh, we've added uh, one step to build the database, which just takes your source code, compiles it, makes sure there are no syntax errors in the source code, uh, makes sure there are no, um, make sure it has proper referential integrity, um, uh, and basically signs off that yes, the code compiles. Um, and then you can run this test step, um, which I've done here. Um, and uh, if I look at the advanced options, there are options here, for example, to uh, only run a specified set of tests or classes um, so that you can kind of parallelize this out across different build agents. It might be set up differently or you just want to get your results back more quickly. Um, so there's clever stuff that you can do here. Yeah? Yeah, so to do it this way, yes. I'm going to explain how you do it. Uh, what do you use? Uh, okay. So um, I'm using VSTS and Git as well. If you look at my source control repository, uh, yeah, leave this page. Um, if you look at my source code repository, I'm using uh, Git inside VSTS as well. Um, what the Redgate component does is if I go to the setup tab, it's just um, uh, pointing at a local repository And it's putting all of my scripts in here. So I've got, for example, all my stored procedures are in here, and I've got a script for each stored procedure. And the way it represents the stuff on disk looks a lot like SSDT. It's just built into Management Studio instead. Which ID do you like? Five minutes. Wow. OK, that went quicker than expected. Um, so that's basically how it works with uh, the Redgate tools, which is what I had. But not all of you are going to use the Redgate tools, so I want to explain how it works the other ways as well. So if you are using either SSDT or ReadyRoll, um, you have, uh, so this is a screenshot from SSDT, you have these database projects that you add to a solution in Visual Studio. And those database projects contain the scripts that are needed to represent your database. Whether it's using SSDT or ReadyRoll, they display the scripts slightly differently, they work slightly differently, um, but they're essentially doing the same thing. ReadyRoll is actually built on top of SSDT. So what you would have is you would have your first project, which contains your source code, and then you'll have an additional project. And what you would do here is you would use Visual Studio Schema Compare to copy across all of the T SQL T objects and the unit tests and everything into um, the additional uh, project. And then what you would do is you would add what's called a database reference. And what this means is the T SQL T database project refers to the, um, your project with the actual source code. And you also need to add a reference to, is it MSDB? Or, no, it's master, it, to master, because T SQL T relies on some of the functionality in master. And then what you can do is, when you just build and deploy your database, you're deploying something without SQL, uh, without T SQL T. And when you build and deploy the, the second project, which has, uh, the second project that has all your tests in it, you're deploying the project that has the tests as well. And that way you can basically determine whether you want to deploy the T SQL T test or not. And then what you would do is you would add as a post-deployment step um, a script that basically just runs t sql t dot run all. Um, and then it will deploy your source code and the test, and then it will actually run the tests. And then you can just run that with a um, Visual Studio build, um, build step in, in, in TFS or VSTS, and that should work, whether you're using ReadyRoll or VSTS. Exactly. Oh, I forgot to mention the way that that works with the Redgate tools is basically there's just a switch on SQL compare, kind of include or exclude T SQL T. So there are, there are mechanisms whichever way you use to allow you to either include T SQL T or not include T SQL T. Um, uh, the only other thing that I would add is with, um, with open source migration scripts runners like Flyaway or DBUp, Typically, you might have like an extra directory of SQL scripts that will have all the scripts for your test framework in a separate place to all the tests for your actual code. And then you can run the test framework afterwards if you want to or not. Again, all the different open source migration tools work slightly differently. Um, but basically, separating out your code and your test suite allows you to choose whether or not you want to include the test suite when you deploy. There was a hand went up somewhere over there. 
pardon. Um, it relies on uh, CLRs being enabled, um, which is, yes. Um, uh, uh, it used to rely on having the trustworthy setting turned on, um, but uh, I don't believe it does anymore. Um, and in general, people just don't like all of this extra T SQL jump in production because. So T SQL T needs to be built on the same physical database, I believe. Um, now, what we've done here, this is just the source code representation of it. Either uh, this is the, how it looks in SSDT. Um, so this is just the representation of it. Um, it's not the actual database itself. When I deploy to the actual production database, I probably don't want uh, uh, T SQL T in there. Um, so that's kind of all I have to say. Uh, and we're what? We're pretty much bang on. Cool. So this is my slide that has words on it. Um, write tests, automate tests, and if you want, get started at tsqlt.org. Um, uh, we weren't given a sponsor slide, but they kind of spent a lot of money so that we could all have this event and keep the ticket price down. So if you haven't gone to say hi to the sponsors yet, you probably should. Um, I was also going to mention SQL Relay. Um, so I don't know who here has been to a SQL Saturday event? Okay. Uh, it's a free community event, um, uh, typically between one and 200 people, three or four tracks, all talking about databases. As I said, I basically sit in the Venn diagram where it crosses over between SQL Server and data platform conferences and DevOps conferences. It disappoints me that there's not a larger pool of people that attend both. Um, they, I see a different set of people at one or the other. Um, I think that it would be really great if people from the DevOps community spent more time thinking about data and how to actually deal with data because I think that um, a lot of the time people from the DevOps community don't give enough time and effort thought to how to apply DevOps to databases. And also I think that people from the data community don't spend enough time coming to continuous delivery in DevOps conferences because how many of you have ever had to work with DBAs? Um, but if you would like to come to SQL Relay, um, it's, uh, it's at the beginning of October, it's free. We're doing an event in Reading, Nottingham, Leeds, Birmingham, and Bristol on consecutive days. Um, so do come along, that's going to be a lot of fun. If you have any questions, probably we're about out of time, so I'll take one question. Or, you, or I'll pass on to Ed, who's kind of going on next. I guess one question is, when I start with T, 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 T,